Welcome to The Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz, a podcast from the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network featuring interviews with the best and brightest entrepreneurs and innovators in the music business. Today's episode features Mike Nickens, composer, arranger, professor, and leader of George Mason University's Green Machine. He talks about how and why the university created a tenure-track position for him and how both networking and branding have been keys to his success. He also shares with us a great system for prioritizing goals and getting things done. He tells us all about it next. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Entrepreneur and Musician. Uh, I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and uh, today I am joined by one of my colleagues at George Mason University. But before I introduce him, I just wanted to ask you that if you have been enjoying uh, the podcast, if you could take just a moment to go to the iTunes store and uh, leave a rating. And uh, if you had uh, a couple of minutes to leave like a one or two sentence review, I would be super helpful in helping other people to find the podcast. Uh, but if not, I'm uh, just uh, really happy that you're listening, and um, a number of you have already been to the iTunes uh, store for reviews, and I, I really appreciate the support. So thank you very much, and uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our guest uh, for this episode, who is uh, Michael Nickens uh, of the uh, the Green Machine, otherwise known as Doc Nix. Uh, how are you doing there, Mike? I'm great, and thanks for uh, putting this setting this up and putting me on. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure if... Um, I'm not sure if this has happened on The Entrepreneurial Musician. I don't think it has, but any of you who are listening to The Brass Junkies, uh, you know that um, whenever one of our guests uh, says a bad word, uh, that uh, they get um, they get bleeped out, um, and it is a uh, it is a pedal F, uh, a, a tuba pedal F, um, and uh, and it didn't dawn on me until I had all the equipment sitting set up and was sitting here, and I told him like, yeah, so. Don't swear, but if you do, it's okay because we'll bleep it out. And then it hit me that he would find it probably funny that um, that F is from the uh, the first note of a piece called Blues and F for Unaccompanied Tuba, which is on uh, the latest album that Lance and I put out. And uh, the composer happens to be the gentleman that is in front of me. So and that's that, that is I'm honored <laughs> and uh, looking forward to what the f*** you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had our first. All right. <laughs> There you go, Austin. Yeah, good luck. Uh, good luck uh, <laughs> bleeping that one out. There, that's pretty funny. So, um, okay. So, um, uh, Mike does a whole lot of stuff. Uh, do you generally? I mean, I know you go by just about anything, but professionally, you go by Mike Goal, or you know, it really depends on who who I'm talking to and who's talking to me. Um, Michael in some settings, and that you know, that's my uh, a lot of folks who are like kind of take up a they kind of take a parental sort of approach to the art, to our professional relationship. And I, I, that's, that's what they'll call me. And, uh, Mike is more of a peer or doc is more of a peer. And of course the students will call me doc or Dr. Nickens, just depending on what the setting is. Sure. Um, so, um, so Michael, Mike, doc, if I may call you that. <laughs> You're all <almost> uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, can you give us, he, he, he wears a whole lot of hats. He's a, um, he's a composer. Uh, he is um, <clears throat> the leader of the pep band here, although just describing him as that uh, does not even begin to get into it, um, which is exactly why he's sitting here. Um, and he has a really interesting backstory. He's a he's a player. Uh, he's a really great player, a great teacher, great band leader, a great composer. Um, it's annoying how many things he does well. Um, but can you um, can you give us kind of a rundown of uh, of your career, of kind of where you started? way back when and then the path that you thought you were going to take and then the path you ended up taking and I'll kind of take the questions from there. Sure. So the uh, the tuba started for me in fifth grade at the Stratford Landing Elementary School Band. Uh, Mr. Hall was my band director. And then... Uh, we don't have time for you to tell us all the programs. I so got just, you. All right, all right good. Yeah, yeah. Right, just making sure. But I just wanted to start with that because to let to, to talk about the strength of the public school yeah. system, a band director got me going. That's awesome. And uh, I didn't have my first lesson actually until a year later. Hmm. Um and was fortunate living in the D.C. area to be able to take lessons with uh, Dave Porter, who played in the Air Force Band for a quarter century. And uh, <laughs> that got me, you know, into every – those lessons and, the, and those experiences in, in the bands got me into every district band I tried, and regional orchestras, and got me involved early in chamber music and, uh, and marching band. Uh, and high, once high school came around, and um, the, the, the 
the high school m- marching band thing was interesting because we didn't have a whole lot of music to play while we were in the bleachers cheering for the football team, and we'd come up with different ideas of songs we wanted to do. And so that's where arranging started. Um, we'd get an idea for a song, and no one knew what to do to make it happen. Well, I also grew up always enjoying playing piano and could listen to a melody, could listen to you know some simple uh, you know bass and melody kind of things, and I could figure them out um, just by ear which then led to learning how to write those things down and um, a combination of that and taking a score and being able to sort of adapt it for whatever the instruments were in the marching band. And then we could play whatever MC Hammer song or theme song from Batman movie or whatever it was we wanted to play at the football games, which then led to at some point a guy ambitious enough to try to write a marching band, like a competition show. And uh, I was... uh, marching drum corps, marched in the 1993 cadets, and got a great experience there, not only uh, with my playing, but also being able to really see, hear, feel how that level of, of, of performance and teaching and everything, creative process, comes together. Um, I spent my freshman year of college at James Madison University, marching in the Marching Royal Dukes and having a great time in the brass band, um, wind ensemble and everything else that was going on, and brass quintet, and then... Finished my undergrad degree at Manhattan School of Music, where I was hitting it hard, lots of orchestra, brass ensemble, uh, brass quintet, solo work, whatever, you know, whatever kinds of things we got involved in. That's when jazz came into my life, started playing in big bands, started playing in combos. I was lucky enough to get to, uh, spend a summer with the Henry Mancini Institute when it was still out in LA. A couple summers in Altenburg, um, playing in the Altenburger Music Festival, um, Master's degree is Yale, and playing in all the great ensembles, undergrad and graduate there. Um, doctors at University of Michigan, uh, peak experience there. A couple of them actually, not only just working in the studio, but um, within the tuba studio. I mean, um, the Creative Arts Orchestra was a, a free improv, you know, multidisciplinary ensemble, uh, which was really a peak experience, bringing everything I wanted to together: conducting, singing, playing tuba, piano. Um, even writing some music, and of course the tuba euphonium ensemble and the tuba euphonium quartets going on there. Um, I was able to get my arranging going in, in such a way that you know, I could write anything for those guys to play, and we would just have such a great time. And so uh, all that kind of was going, and still writing for marching bands, spending my summers with marching bands and in and, and public schools and things like that, picking up as many professional gigs as I could, picking up some Students, mostly high school, but uh, Michigan, I was actually teaching some of the undergrads as well when that came up. And then uh, 2006 rolled around, I'm graduating, and at the same time, George Mason basketball makes it to the Final Four. And uh, the energy that came from that, the boost that that gave the university, um, they already had a, a, a strong tradition of a student-run pep band here, and then as everything's growing... It made it made sense to hire a faculty member to lead this ensemble, and that really got its, you know, the, got it over the hump when that when the team went to the final four. So that kind of galvanized the the opportunity, and then I got the job. Started off on an annual contract, and uh, was teaching not only the pep band but some sight singing and um, a history of pop music, and uh, taught many things while I've been here over the years. But uh, the success of the pep band continued you know the, the it wasn't just linked to that one year of basketball but we we've been we've had some really great success and and then about a year and a half in um the dean decided to make my position a, a tenure track position and um put me into that tenure track and i made it through the probation period successfully and now i'm a tenured professor of music i don't know that there are many uh many uh, athletic band directors that are are tenured but i guess a, uh, another way to look at it is it's not just because of what's going on with the pep band, but I now I'm teaching, teach, teach, you know, doctoral students on tuba and composition, and I have done some work with the jazz department, and um, we got our drum line going, we got our color guard going, we've started uh, other types of ensembles, so, and then I'm sitting here right now, and here we are. This is probably the highlight of your career, right? This interview that you're getting paid a ton of money for. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I get a chance to hang out with you <laughs> is time well spent, because particularly because it gets me back to feeling like 
a tuba player. Like I have to remember to do that, you know, sure. going in so many directions at once. And, uh, you know, just all the things we, we, we've, we've done some playing. We haven't done enough playing together, but we've done some playing and that was a lot of fun. We can looking forward to doing some more. Yeah. Um, um, you made the recording of the solo. Uh, I don't know what, uh, what you thought of the, some of the stuff I sent you this summer. Get a chance to look through some of that. Yep. Um, loved it. Hear, hear, hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then I don't know. Let's invent something. You know, that's, that, that's, the name of the game with me is if I don't see what it is I want to do, then I just make it. I'm just do my best to make it. And, and it, it goes pretty well, actually. Anybody who has been listening to all of the episodes of this podcast, that's, uh, everybody uses different words and they've all created different things, you know, cause, uh, cause there's been a wide range of uh, occupations, but that's a really, it's a common, uh, theme amongst the guests so far. It's just, yeah, if it doesn't exist, create it or, if it exists and it's not good enough, then, uh, you know, there's two types of, it. yeah, there's two types of people, right? There's the people who, um, who complain about things not being good enough. And then there are other people who either fix it and, you know, some people try and fix it. And then so there's a subset of that, that when they try and fix it and they fail, they try and fix it a different way. And if they fail at that, then they create something else that they right. just, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of, there's a theme of people not really taking no uh, for an answer, you know? Um, Go don't ahead. don't uh, underestimate the power of burning the whole house down too, and starting from you know you think you had something you worked so hard trying to clean it up, trying to fix it, and at some point it's better to just let it collapse, and then you can start your building blocks exactly how you want them to, at least exactly what's based on what's available. Um, yeah, well said. You know? Yeah, one of the one of the um, the worst idea to, to I was I, I heard a great quote that like the worst idea. Uh, the worst reason, excuse me, to ever do anything is because that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> right. You know, or, right. or, well, that's the way we've always done right. it, you know. And, uh, that's a useful, uh, if that is the case and somebody's new and you say that, as long as you're not saying, which means that we need to, you know, and if you want to keep doing it, it's always good to be able to articulate that, you know. There's a, there's something to, uh, a purist act that can be a lot of fun. You know, I think about like, so one of the ensembles we've created at Mason is a, a colonial period fife and drum corps. Now, I look at that very much as a period piece. This is like we are trying to sort of recreate an adaptation, a modern adaptation of something that reaches back into time and find a, a, a contemporary application for it. Now, I already know it's going to be possible because I know what's going on with the old guard. I know what's going on with fife and drum corps all around the state and actually around the country. Um, the more I looked into it, the more I found. So it's like, that as a specific type of exercise, as I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of that. But to think that if I had some, you know, idea that, you know, this is the way music was done and we need to get rid of all the things that are people are trying to do and, and go back to this, that's just not really my personality. I think, I think who we are today, um, we, we are going to be the best judges, um, not on everything, but on, on some very specific things or what's going to be best for us. And, um, you know, having the idea that no one can see what you can see. Um, you, you may be the only one that understands what you're talking about, what you're thinking of, and therefore the only one that can bring it to fruition. So if it's, if it's about simply retracing steps, you know, the, the, uh, I guess so, but it could, that could also be, you know, really robbing yourself of some self, um, actualization that could be, that could change everything for everybody because of how unique we all are as, as individuals, as uh, as I, I recently heard, uh, Seth Godin, who uh, who my wife, uh, my favorite author, who I mention on uh, on every single uh, episode. If anybody have heard has heard me mention him five times, and they've read all of his books, which is actually a lot, so they, and they keep hearing me quote him, they're like, "We know, dude. We we read the books." My wife uh, refers to <laughs> Seth Godin as my spirit animal, so because uh, I quote him too often uh, around the house too. So aren't I a fun person to be married to? Yeah, it's like, am I being romantic? No, I'm just talking about Seth. Godin, yeah, and, and and permission marketing, yeah. It's like I I love you, honey. So, um, but uh, oh, what the heck was I saying? Uh, something about um, uh, in terms of oh yes, of course that um completely lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, about how if um you know if people need and this is we're going to get into this part about how uh you are um you are a brand, you are a very distinctive. Um, he is, um, uh, and I'm putting this in quotation marks and air quotes. He is just the pep band director. 
uh, and he is on like the posters for the basketball team, like the 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 advertising posters that they make, the graphic department does, which are awesome. Um, you know, for for the season, I mean, uh, like he's he's more recognizable than any of the players currently are on the team. Um, and so, and that, that's not by accident. And, um, uh, and, and there's a lot, I think, and it was all very organic it, well, it, from knowing you well enough. None of it was forced. And yet, if you kind of reverse engineer it to kind of try and tear it down, there was a bunch of intentional stuff that you did in some order thing, to. Yeah, some things really went, went right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, what, what Seth Godin's point is, um, in the book Tribes, which I would strongly recommend, uh, anybody listening to, uh, to, to read. Um, or listen to on Audible, uh, which is how I uh, he he reads all the books. It's great. Um, he talks about how um, you have to um, you need people to uh, to need you. They can't just need what you do because if they just need a pep band leader who can write good charts, um, there are there's not a thousand pep band leaders in America or potential ones that can write good charts. But there's more than five, Absolutely. you know. There's a lot more than five, and so um, and, the, and new ones popping up, you uh, know, every year. Yes, who yes. Are straight out of school and probably a lot cheaper. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I guarantee you a lot cheaper. And so that's the thing is that if uh, if the only thing that's in demand is what you do and not you, that's a race to the bottom in terms of pricing. Right. Um, if uh, you know, when you think the Kronos Quartet, that's not that's not just a string quartet yeah, that's like if you hire the chronos quartet yes. if you hire them to play your wedding and then you're confused as to why they're not you know playing some mendelssohn <laughs> for you and by the way they could play the, the, the you know what out of mendelssohn but yeah why would you want that uh, when you can have electric night well exactly exactly <laughs> so uh but but that's why chronos is not going anywhere it's because like people hire chronos because they need chronos <laughs> not because they need a good string quartet because like you said there's there's four college kids who are juniors at Juilliard who have been right. friends since second week of freshman year who could who can play their tails off individually and together who are going to be a lot less than Kronos is right. and not require five separate hotel rooms and limos from the airport and uh you know yada 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 so um so yeah that that's why so so i i think i'd love to talk to you about um about the about having a tenure track position created for you because if uh if I had a student who I said, all right, in five years, where do you, you know, 10 years, where do you want to be? Tell me exactly what you want to do with your career. And they told me that they wanted to, um, to get hired to conduct a pep band at a, at a university. And then the plan was to have that university create out of thin air a tenure track position for them. Um, and I try to, I give every, try to give all my students permission to pursue anything, but I would be remiss if I didn't say, yeah, that's probably not going to happen, dude, you know, and it did happen and it happened for a reason, uh, because they weren't just, I think they created the position for you. I mean, that, that's, that's why. And, and so can you talk about how that kind of went down? Not the inside baseball and like the, you know, private conversation no, stuff, no, but no, like, but the, how did that come about? Like, right. why did the dean, deans are trying to push people away who are trying to, because, Guess what? The brass faculty here would like a tenure track position sure. added, and the vocal faculty would like a vote. All not in a bad way, just in a you know they want their areas to be stronger. So deans right. have to be pushing those people away, not saying, "Hey, I have an idea." So how did that go down? You know, Bill Reeder is a visionary and uh, very much into uh, creating community, and specifically at George Mason here outside of, of Washington D.C. Um, Cultural, ethnic mix here, um, we haven't even begun to touch it, you know, in terms of higher ed and um, in terms of the cultural life of this area. Uh, we're we're uh, becoming aware of it, you know. And then as that connects to degree programs and um, extracurricular activities, you know, it's I just from my own point of view, the reason why I would say it would be me, why I think it has to be me, is my just maybe my personal take on, you know, what what kind of music can we make work in a in this setting, and what should we be pursuing that isn't currently in the mix, and I'm not saying I'm the only only person, um, but I'm definitely a person who is going after that, and so I was able to show up with the doctorate already in hand, already finished, um, with. Years of experience with marching bands, football bands, the understanding of what 
can happen in terms of galvanizing a community around that type of event, that type of you know the ceremony that's uh, embedded in, in into a sporting event, um, and how music can basically just drive the entire thing. Um, take it a little f- further, you know, there's approaches of putting together groups that are best in class, and we want to have only the best, and we're going to sort of sort of uh, validate ourselves based on how many people we cut. And uh, the Green Machine, you know, the only reason we even try at all to, we, we don't try to get anybody to go away. We just don't have enough seats in the bleachers for everybody at the game. That's literally it. Um, and, and as soon as I can figure out all the things that we could play somewhere else, you know, I'm looking down the road at James Madison. They're always, you know, knocking on the door of 500 members. There's no reason that George Mason's not going to have the exact same thing. Um, other than we need to just figure out exactly what we're going to use that size ensemble for and how we're going to use it. So backing off from that idea of best in class and more like, do you want to play? Do you want to try to do this? Can we include you? Which has led us to uh, adding an entire string section. We've had as many as 30 violin, viola, cello players at once in the band. Um, we have, we have an electric harp, which I've never seen. I didn't even really know that existed until we started trying to figure it out. I Um, just found out it existed. Yeah. We've had, we've had singers, rappers, DJs. Um, I have a melodica player right now. I've had guitar, um, all sorts of electronic drums and, um, auxiliary percussion. We've added drum line. We've, we will continue to add drumline, um, dancers, all sorts of things. Um, so it's that exercise is about how many people we can can we include and how can we capitalize on their strength by having them there. What can we do that we couldn't do without them? And let's go after that and 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 really um, highlight you know the the things that we can do that that we weren't able to do before. So it just be kind of becomes an all swim and and then you know there's obviously still some some hierarchy there. I need a great drummer. On um, that group, that, that the drummer is the concert master of that of that band. Um, you know, I, I need great lead singers that can you know, really put on a show, particularly in front of ten thousand people and ESPN cameras in their eye, you know, right in their face. Um, we, want, we want people who dance around, people who are outgoing, people who are creative. Um, what's going on now is most of the music that's being written for the group is all student student led, so it's like it's becoming its own educational system, not only for the creative design but also for management. Um, and all these things are what we want. It's like, and it's for everybody. It belongs to everyone, and and we're gonna try and find a place for everyone. So, all that leading back to Bill Reader and his idea of community building. It's like, well, if you want to build a community, you've got to make room for folks. And so, as I started off talking about, you know, the D.C. area and higher ed, you know, I had a great time playing in some heavy duty student orchestras. And repertoire um, that stretched my stretched my brain, stretched my awareness, and I learned something from every second of that. Um, e- even the things that I didn't quite get while I was doing it, found a stronger appreciation for them over time. Go back and listen to recording, or whatever. And at some point, you had to sit around and notice. You know, I'm a, I'm at Manhattan. That's in school with Stevie Wonder's daughter, but we're not doing any Stevie Wonder, for instance. Right. Um, you know, all the great brass writing that goes into every Earth, Wind, and Fire chart, and there's no chance to actually play it unless it's some, you know, maybe maybe, maybe the occasional adapt- adaptation for a big band. But it's not really, you know, a real core part of, of what we're learning. And it, to me, it seems like such a strong part of the American experience that it has to find its way in. Right. And then if we're talking about, you know, African-American music here, now what? Who else? who else is not? being represented who else is not finding themselves and then i go you know i go into a high school a public high school and i see a beautiful diverse mix in the hallway but then i go into a choir or a band and that diversity is not there and it might be because of the interest of what music is being chosen it might be because of um you know not access to instruments for some reason or another maybe it's an economic thing maybe it's just simply a not idea that they don't somebody doesn't see themselves as part of it so I can't save everybody, but I'm going to try and change that for the people that come around me. Hmm. So that's that sort of work takes a lifetime, and that's why you tenure some tenure someone trying to do something like that. That's great. The um, this is uh, I feel like I repeat myself a lot on on this podcast uh, from episode to episode. So yeah, and I know everyone listens to every episode. Absolutely. So I you know so that that's why I worry about it. Uh, is that um, if you're going to be a pep band leader, 
uh, and you're going to write charts, um, it's it's almost not a value add to be a good pep band leader or to write good charts because that's that's required. If I'm the professional tuba player in a brass quintet, then like I, I don't get I don't get points for having good time. I mean, right. I'm the tuba player in a professional brass quintet. What 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 the heck else is am I supposed to do? You right. know, or for having good intonation. So just meaning that. You, yeah, you have to be able to write well, and you have to be a good band leader to have the job and to keep the job in the first place. It's all of the it's it's what you do beyond that, and the fact that you're talking about community building and how you just described that, it all made perfect sense. Yeah. And if I were to if I were to read a, um, I say this with like zero judgment. There's just there's no there wouldn't my thought wouldn't go into it because I'm not in you know I'm not in the market to become a pet band leader. That's not it's not what I do. Um, and if I read that, I would not think like, oh, they should get a community builder when, of course, they should, <laughs> you know. Um, and there, so that, been, that's interesting. Yeah, folks have called and, and asked me about that. And I can't always give them the, the kind of answer they're looking for. You know, I think they're I think they're trying to ask me, well, what song should I play? Or, you know, how is it that you run rehearsal? And it's, you know, like there's a lot to talk about there. But the real answer behind all of it is. You need to take a good look at who you are and what you love, what gets you excited. Like, what's the effect you're after? And, like, what what gets you there? And, and you know, some nostalgia gets you there. Um, what's the hottest new thing gets you there? Um, you know, sometimes it's, like, neither nostalgia nor the hottest new thing. There's some tune that should be in your consciousness as a young American or as an American, period. And because, because we're all going to be able to connect on this because there's some little dance that goes with it or most of the people in the room... We'll sing along, clap along, something like that. And so it's like this real uh, attempt to like find honesty in in the design of the whole thing, in, in to find honesty in the music, in the performance. And so if you if you can find that, then everyone will just everyone will, will come together around it. If that's what you're after, then that's the only answer I can give you because you know even around the Beltway might be a little different on the Maryland side than the Virginia side. You know, there might just be some local band that might be the perfect thing to cover or to even bring and be part of the show or, um, you know, some 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 dance craze that happened, like I said, just on the other side of the belt where it didn't happen over here. And then we missed it. I mean, we missed out on it because we, we didn't live over there, that kind of thing. So uh, one of um, one of Mike's uh, calling cards is um, is the the – the attire that you wear uh, yes uh, at the uh, <laughs> excuse me at the at the games um, and um, he you have a a very specific uh, you know like kind of suit that you wear I mean and you've got a whole bunch of them but 17. it's like seven, <laughs> 17 uh, yeah that's um that's 15 more than I own and both of them are black <laughs> uh, the um, the so you've got 17 different suits and uh, and you've got like a, a a scepter, it's right? A cane, yeah, it's, it's a, a cane. scepter. It's a baton. It's a, it's kind of whatever I need it to be. Where uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, you can you can if the electric uh, harp isn't working, you can whack it real right. hard so you know get the get the wires connected again. Um, yeah, you, you know you wear sunglasses a lot. I mean, there's like there there's an absolute brand. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, and if you've seen the suits, and you've probably seen some of the videos online because millions of people have, but uh, you know, if you were to, you know, if you Google, uh, you know, Google image search for him, you're going to see like a wide range of suits that he infuriatingly pulls off. And if I were to wear, people would be like, "Don't wear that ever again, and don't ever come <laughs> over again." Like, just like, P please, just uh, please. That's all. That's great. You should go host some more podcasts somewhere else. Um, but you have a brand. I mean, like, you know, and you have an energy, and it's like, um, it's a persona, which I in, want to be very clear. There's no, there's nothing fake about it or forced about it. But you're you're performing just like the students are, um, and not in a way at all that upstages them. It's like it's kind of fascinating. Um, so can you talk about that branding and how much of it was intentional and how much of it was unintentional sure. and and kind of how that's paid off for you? The uh, genesis of it was, you know, the kinds of things I found I was able to do in high school just simply because I was wearing a marching band uniform, um, including just running through the gate without a ticket because everyone clearly understood you're part of the show. 
you can get into Tanglewood, by the way, pretty easily if you just wear a tuxedo. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. It's gotta be a, it's gotta be a white jacket, but yeah, oh, right, right, or or no right. jacket, but you can go to any Boston Symphony Orchestra concert I'm for saying, free. Man. So at least you used to be able to, right, yeah, right. a long time ago. Now that's I pay because I just I'm old enough where it's like, yeah, that's no good. So so then uh, you know we're we're making this this experience for the basketball arena. And, uh, you know, musically it makes sense if we're in a stadium to play some stadium rock. So we have our ACDC and we have our Bon Jovi and we, and we rock it, you know. Um, but then it's like, well, so what's the attire? I mean, this, the, the marching, you know, high school and college marching tradition, drum corps tradition, has so much strong roots in the military. And military look... I'm talking about the sensibility of a of a stadium rock concert. I don't I don't I didn't find that coming together very well. Um and then I two two things I can think of. I thought I was watching the movie Drumline and I saw the pinstripes that the the bad guy band director was wearing. <laughs> I thought that was kind of sweet. And uh a couple years later I'm sitting there watching Flavor of Love and Flavor Flav is wearing this shiny beautiful suit. <laughs> I'm like, I got it. I know what I'm going to do. So hey, I got to interject. About uh, 10 years ago, I was walking, eh, maybe 15 years ago, I was walking through Times Square uh, on by myself. It was about 9 p.m., and a limo pulled up and uh, and the stopped, and the door flew open, and it was Flava Flav nice. who jumped out of his limo, and like immediately there was like a crowd of like yeah, of 50 people around, and he's just looking around. He's not saying anything, and then he, and then he just screamed, Flame, flame. <laughs> and then and then he jumped back in the limo, slammed the door, and then the limo took oh, off. Man. It was surreal even by New York City That's standards. Glorious. So uh <laughs> So yeah, so um That's awesome. So you saw something. Sorry, I totally took yeah, you yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It's like then thinking about, you know, I've been a sports fan my whole life and seen many a college basketball game on TV, been to some college games, and um you know, the idea of like what the mascot does and what the cheerleaders do and thinking about what I did as a drum major in high school and kind of combined all, all those ideas together and came up with, if I got suits that were school colors rather than coming out wearing a polo and some khakis, I myself would have a lot more fun and would be able to get into the show a lot and become part of the production a lot more. Get like, I would probably act very similarly no matter what I was wearing, but those clothes give me the opportunity. It gave me access. Instead of just staying on the side of the court and conducting the band, now I'm invited to go out onto the floor during timeouts. Access run, and permission. You know what I'm saying? I run around the stadium. I smack five with with, uh, with students on the other side of the court. Um, every donor and administrator that sits courtside. Um, I'm going to get to that in a second. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, and then, and then of course it's, it becomes really, really TV friendly too. So the cameras are on, I'm dancing, I'm trying to, you know, show, show my, how, how hype I am and how hype the, the band is and, um, just try to tie it all together and, and be, become a, a visual character, you know, a musical character, well, multi-dimensional character, I guess. That's, that's great. So it was intentional. You know, it's like in, <clears throat> in terms of what I mean by that is that, um, that you saw some things that you liked, yeah, and you had a a, a past that you kind of referenced, but it wasn't going to quite line up, and so you just, Did yeah, this it. worked in the past, but then right. you evaluated who your customers were in front of you, yes. and is that going to work right now? It worked for me before with all these customers. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's really great. Um, that's and it's uh, and and I I have um um I've. I, We've all done the same thing on some level. You've really, you've taken it out. There's a persona, which is great. But when I, when I do a standard clinic now for a high school band, um, if I'm doing the body mapping and breathing gym class, or if I'm playing a solo with the band, a high school band at night, and I just meet the kids and I'm working with them and rehearsing, whatever, my standard dress now is that I wear, um, I wear, uh, blue jeans with like a black, usually untucked, like, you know, dress shirt with a black coat and dress shoes. And so it's like, uh, the blue jeans is so, and whether that's great or not great, I mean, that, that's not changing the world, but it is intentional because I don't want to wear an entire suit and, and tie, uh, cause that, that's, doesn't really scream. You should totally come up and ask me some silly question right, afterwards, right, right. which I want them to, I want to be approachable, Absolutely. but it's also not, 
<clears throat> excuse me, it's also not like, oh yeah, I was just at a, you know, I was just at a Nats game and I just kind of <laughs> left in the seventh inning and now I'm going to talk to you guys for some money. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like, right. so, so it's kind of a little bit in between. I, uh, I, I have this thing with the khakis, man. I, uh, I'll do it. I, 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 I'm not 100% at home in them. I'm just not. And, uh, the right kind of nice, I have black jeans I wear and blue jeans I wear. Um, and yeah, I'll get, of course I'll get dressed up in some nice slacks and, 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 I, and I can make the khakis work, but they are, uh, they're kind of low on my list. And hmm. it's just, you know, something about us as, as young professionals, we have a different dress code. And because there's some specific things we're trying to accomplish, I don't know if you've ever got a chance to check out my TED talk where I talk about, yes, what, I talk about Air Jordans mm-hmm. and how in our generation they became dress shoes and obviously not the kind of dress shoes you would necessarily think of as wearing to church, but there's a different venue that you dress up a different kind of way. There's just a, a, a different etiquette there. Um, and I wear them on stage, especially if I'm going to do hip hop. Why would I wear anything but some Air Jordans if I'm going to do a hip hop performance? Sure. Yeah. I used to buy a pair of Air Jordans every single year when I was a little kid. So right. <clears throat> I was basketball obsessed growing up in the 80s in Boston. One of the uh, ways, a, a real clear way someone has described what I'm wearing at the games is a specific thing. I found a, a gi in uh, Beijing. Uh, we took the we took the George Mason Jazz Band over there to do some concerts, some walking through a market. Uh, all the suits are school colors, so gold, green, white, and black are the colors we, I, I go after. And then some of them are dead shot down the center, and some of them are kind of uh, sort of glancing to the side, whatever. But I found this 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 beautiful green olive green gi with golden dragons. Uh, and then uh, we put some. Uh, off of, uh, thank Julie Chakula, who, who, out of the white pants and black pants we saw, she said, "You know, you wear gold pants with this one." So I wear the gold pants. <laughs> you know, it's just the, you know, other people's suggestions of these things. You know. <laughs> and then I put, of course, I put the, the the shades on. I always always performing with the sunglasses on. And then I have the, the cane. The cane and the glasses are sort of the the constant. Even though I have lots of different pairs of glasses, but I always always wearing the glasses. And some of the outfits have hats, but not all of them. And um. Yeah, the, the, it was described as, I can't tell if you're supposed to be in a hip hop video or a kung fu movie. And I'm like, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> I'm guessing that like Jackie Chan and DMX have probably already made that movie. It's like right, a right. combination of the two. So with a little, maybe a little R. Kelly thrown in, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of the donors and the, people courtside that you were talking about um you uh i've seen you work a room before and uh you know it's like you're running for office except not in uh, uh you know th- it's impossible to not take that as a negative and I, I don't i don't i don't mean any of the negative there it's like my my son who's 16 months old who's very gregarious and he just he attempts to make eye contact with every person in a restaurant he right. smiles at all of them and we always joke that he's like He's running for mayor, you know. I mean, on. yeah, exactly. Um, and um, and so, you, but you do it in a very. Uh, politicians don't care really about many of us, but uh, most of us. But anyway, that's a different podcast. I've got some politicians that take very good care of me. Yeah, good. So, Absolutely. but the the point is that you, you know, you can work a room like you really connect with people. Your networking is impeccable. Um, can you talk about your approach to networking? Well, you know. I feel like it's at, at its core is really me trying to, you know, when I say the word friend, I, I have a lot of different, different definitions there. And with all of us in our work, if we're getting satisfying work done, we're going to become multiple different types of friends as, as we're working. And for someone like, you know, someone in the arts who's their passion and their work and their identity is very, very much just tangled woven all sorts of things up in there you know your your contacts become lots of different types of people to you and uh so so it's i i feel i feel like it's me trying to make great work with people that i want to make the work with you know and i i can think of you know the gigging days when and you you've had this and you've called people and you've taken them to the gig and you're you know you you're the one that Call the folks and got everyone together. And there's eventually going to be someone that sounds great. 
but you don't want to sit next to them in the car. You don't want to sit next to them on the gig. You don't want to go out to dinner with them afterwards. Yes. So it's like, if I can, if I got 10 people who can play the gig and I got to get all the way down to the fourth or fifth person before it's someone who I actually want to sit there with, you know, if that person can play the gig and it's not going to do us any damage, I'd much rather go with that than someone who I'm just going to be miserable and they're just trying to get paid and glorify whatever they're trying to glorify, you know? First Dixie gig I ever played, well, anywhere, but in Arizona, uh, showed up and, um, and I was nervous because I was totally out of my comfort zone. There was a trombone player who I won't name. Actually, I, I barely even remember his name because he was inconsequential. Uh, just as a human, you know, like he, uh, that's a little harsh, but just like he was a drag, he was a drag to work with. And he, I can tell you why he said, uh, he saw that I was young whenever he asked me what my name was and, you know, he introduced himself and then he said, uh, he said, you know, why, uh, you know, why I, I, uh, you know, you know, I am a musician for a living. And I said, nope. And he said, because I haven't found anything easier than this yet. All right. That, I mean, this was like 15 seconds after meeting him was like, as soon as I can find something easier to make money, I'm out of here. And it was like, whoa, you okay. know? Yeah. Yeah. I, of course I never hired him for, and I yeah. wasn't hiring many people in, in Arizona. I was still in graduate school. I don't want to exaggerate, but if I had started, I, I wouldn't have, uh, you know, if my career hadn't right. taken me out of town, I would have, uh, you know, you get a little older, you start hiring people. I never would have hired him because he just like, he bummed the whole place out immediately. I mean, it was like really kind of a, Man. Yeah, right. Did you get that kind of gig, man. What I want to do is I want I want I want a drummer that knows how to get everyone's body moving. I want to get in that. I love I love playing sousaphone. I love getting that beat and getting into the boom, 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 boom. And what I want is a trombone player who knows. You know what I'm saying? It's like. That's yes. all we need to be talking about. We need to be performers. Man. Yes. Why else would you want to get into doing party music, which that is, right. if you're not there to party, <laughs> yeah, you know? I, I agree. In some level. I mean, yeah, we gotta work and, and, and we gotta work hard to have fun, you know? We gotta take, we gotta take our fun very seriously, you know? But boy, that fun's gotta be in there, you know? As, I'm, as I'm I've said before, that. as I've said before, uh, on this, uh, on this podcast and I've written about it and I'll keep telling it to everybody you know like 95% in my opinion the number is 95% of the music business makes it really easy to work with them to get along with them to uh, to treat them with respect all of the time right. to give them the benefit of the doubt all of the time um, to if they show up late to something you assume something really bad has happened um, uh, and uh, 5% of the music business makes it really difficult to be kind to them all the time. Right. Maybe some of them it's easy to be kind to them half of the time, and right. then the other half it's like, uh-oh, here she comes, or oh, here he comes. It's one of those days. Um, and yet that the uh, the um, <laughs> that our reputations are staked on uh, on how easy we are to work with are on how we deal with the 5%. It has nothing to do with the 95%. Because wow. if you're on a gig with... With Mike Nickens, like you're not even on a bad day. You could, you could, you know, whatever. <laughs> you could, you could be dealing with some real unpleasant stuff, and like, you know, you're gonna. We'll make it through, man. Yeah, of course, you know? and you're gonna, you're gonna show up. You're gonna be on time. You're gonna smile. You're not gonna be snapping anybody, saying like the only reason you do this is because it's it's easy. Or, uh, or if you you get me on that gig, the last thing I'm gonna do is tell you what terrible time I, I'm having. Yeah, of course. You know what I'm saying? Another another uh another story that I told on an early episode of this that you need to hear and anybody that didn't hear it before needs to hear. Rich Kelly, uh former lead trumpet player of Boston Brass, um possibly the most talented, gifted musician I've ever played with. He's on the shortest list possible. That's how good he is. Um he uh I I've been very blessed in my career to get to play with some heavies and he's he's uh, at or near the top of the list. He was playing uh he was 18 years old summer after his uh his freshman year at Juilliard. He's playing in Central Park in August. Not a good place to be outdoors playing uh, uh all marches concert. He's playing third trumpet. Yeah, over and over and over again. 
Woman next to him uh, tells him, "Hey, you sound really good." He says, "Thank you very much." He's sweating. Rich could sweat in an igloo. I mean, like you know, he just like he he's just drenched in sweat. Half hour later, she says, "You sound really good," and he just said, "Thank you very much." And he was not having a good time, but he's he's always smiling. He has a smile that could light up a basketball arena. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, um, and then she a third time, like you know, five minutes, she said. She said, you sound incredible. And he just said, thank you so much. And, you know, he's a kid. He's baby faced now and he's in his, like, in his, in his mid forties, you know, and like, and he was 18. She said, have you ever played on Broadway? And he said, uh, nope, uh, you know, I, I haven't. And then she said, uh, would you ever want to? And then suddenly Rich, like, looked at her like, wait, who, who the heck are you, lady? Right. You know, this was the contractor for Kiss of the Spider Woman, hey, which was like it. major, major, major Broadway show in the eighties. Awesome. And yep. And, and, uh, important people never sit down. And when you say, hi, I'm Rich. And then they say, hi, I'm Susan. I'm really important. No, they're not they don't say that. Right. Could, no. Like barely yeah. important people we'll, we'll will say, say how they're right, important, right, right. you know. It's people trying to be important. It, will yes, say yes, <laughs> exactly. But the the point is that his attitude and how well he was playing, even though he's playing third trumpet on all mar- two hours of marches in a hundred degree humidity in New York. Right. Like you said, you get down to that seventh person on the list, you want to be sitting next to them That's right. in the van on the gig, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and so, yeah, you, you're energetic all the time, especially when you're on stage and when you're, you know, when you're in that persona. And so I'm sure, I'm sure that, uh, and, and you are off stage too, but I just mean that like, it's, um, you know, something that we tried to do. Um, I'm sure they still are trying to do in Boston brass, but I, I speak past tense for when I was in it, that we tried to always do, um, was to be very, to go out of our way when we were at a concert series to um, give time to the donors when it was asked of us right. <clears throat> because right. those are the people sure. you want to talk about uh, about looking good to a presenter like a presenter desperately has to maintain all of the donors that they have and they have to uh, they have to try and get more out of them when they can when it's appropriate and to add donors and to try not to lose them and have no attrition there and so when some donor wants to ask me 15 minutes worth of tuba questions then, Absolutely. then, yeah, and 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 on just a human level, it's the right thing to do. But um, it's also it's again intentional, you know, like just being intentional about like this is going to make the presenter look good. Which uh, we make the presenter look good, we're gonna look good. That's right. gonna make them happy. And presenters hang out with drum roll, please, other presenters, That's right. you know, who are a couple hours away, uh, two time zones away. They all hang out. They go to the APAP conference uh, in New York together. They know each other. They give each other recommendations, both good and bad. Boston Brass sounded amazing. They are a nightmare to, to work with. Do not hire them. Or they right. sounded amazing, and they thanked every single person backstage. They <clears throat> they talked to the donors. That's they right. did everything. Yes, they will make you look really good. Um, you know your your reputation precedes you. So, um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was um. When I walked into the uh, the office here, um, there's uh, one of the walls is like a, is a whiteboard. It's like right. a, is a big whiteboard, and um, there is um, there's in four different colors uh, up on the wall. Uh, there is uh, r- the the left hand column. the 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 um, The title of it is urgent, uh, urgent and important, and that's written in red. To the right of that, it says urgent but not important. Uh, to the right of that, in blue, it says not urgent but important. And then to the right of that is not urgent and not important. And, um, it's, it's great to, um, I talk all the time about the business model canvas and using post-it notes for poster boards. And that's what Lance and I used to, to get to the bottom of what pedal note media was going to look like. And we figured out we were going to do podcasts and what we were going right. to do and this, that, whatever. Um, can you talk about this system? Cause it sure. seems it's, uh, you started talking to me about it cause I saw it and I was like, oh, that's awesome. And I'd love for you to share that with the audience. You know, I'm going to give full credit to the uh, Green Machines Associate Director, Jeremy Freer. Those were his categories. Awesome. And the color, color coding system. And then, uh, you know, the, the three of us on the staff maintain that. And so a, a big pleasure to be able to remove things from the board. Right. And, uh, it's also a, a good discussion on where something is going to end up on there. And um, so that focuses the task before you even start down the road of figuring out who's going to take care of it. Right. That's great. And, and you know, sometimes just that examination of where it's going to end up has to do with who's interested in tackling it or is it, you know, we say the word important, but sometimes that really means essential. We don't have a band if we don't do this, that kind of thing. 
There's a whole lot of band directors. My wife's a band director. Yeah, they figure that out quickly. That's yeah, right. when you don't have the permission slips on your person that you're There's required no legally to have, That's then, it, yeah, there's no trip. Exactly. You don't rent buses. You ain't going to exactly right. get adjudicated to, yeah, and there's going to be a mutiny when there's, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of amusement park tickets purchased and they're not going on the roller coasters. That's so. right. Or you try to go purchase them and, oh, by the way, you missed your budget meeting. So, uh, yes. The money's not where it needed to be in the first place. Or the so. deadline and they're all $30 more than you thought, all which that. means you got to come up with Trip, another $2,000. Yes. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, and then, you know, another thing that makes it that, into that category is things that, that are for people that have done so many things for us that make us who we are that we have to give give them our best effort. It takes care of our relationships, that, that red category, that, that urgent and important. So more networking. Exactly right. Um, but then, you know, the entire system, I'd say, has has two things we're trying to accomplish. One of them is we absolutely cannot do every good idea we come up with. It's just, it's some of, some of the ideas are in direct conflict with each other. Maybe not necessarily in principle, but in time commitment, for instance. We just don't have enough time to do both. So we have to pick one over the other. Um, and there's no, sometimes not even a real reason why one's better than the other. We just have to pick one. One, we get to pick one and we have to get rid of one. And, and then we do the best we can to make those kinds of decisions. Um, another thing we're trying to accomplish is maintain our own mental health. So getting things out of our brains and trying to uh, get it in front of us so we can kind of see things next to each other. Also, between the three of us being able to communicate with written word, we're all looking up there. We all see it every day. And some things, you know, what are we doing right now to take care of the red category, the urgent and important category? Or what kinds of things are we not so worried about because we can let them slide, we can push it to next year, it's a great idea, but we may never get around to it or whatever it is. Then there's that not important, not urgent, and it's up there in this l- lovely, comforting green. <laughs> and um, Soothing. Yeah, you know, because the red, like I, uh, I was saying earlier, that red is your your hair is on fire right now and you need to put it out. And uh, the green is not is the opposite of that. That green is... I can't stay in that heightened alert state for too many hours in a row. I need to step away from it. And I'll feel best if I continue to be productive. So there are certain things that end up in that green category. They are a fun idea. They are uh, a silly idea that will just uh, take us in a, in, in a, in a light, nice, nice lighthearted direction. Um, they're solving a problem that we have it solved with some C-plus answer. But here's the A-plus answer. We'll be fine with the C-plus, but the A-plus is going to be much better. Um, but it gives you a chance to still be productive and just really shut out the, here's what here's someone else's emergency that they've decided is urgent, or they're trying to sell it to you as, as if it's urgent. And sometimes we find that it really isn't. But, um, but you know, we're in, in our best faith trying to get those tasks in the right categories. But every now and then you just need to step away and go into that green category and let yourself do something for you. Do something that will just will just never find its way into the day to day grind. You just have to just it's more it's more of like your hobby approach to your job. This fun thing you can add to it that, that there just isn't time to if you're maintaining the calendar or whatever task you're you've been you know, you've been assigned. So and then the uh the black is the uh urgent but not important and the blue is the important but not urgent some things are going to be they're going to work just fine five years from now as they will work this year and the uh the black category the the urgent but not important if i can get it done i need to get it done today if i can get it done i will but if it slips through it's just going to slip through and you know there's going to be no blood on the floor if it slips through so i'm just going to have to let it slip through that's great. I love the fact that it's not only written down. Uh, I love the quote that a a goal that is not written down is just a wish. Um, but uh, that not not that it's just written down, but that it is like that it's the entire wall of the the you know it's like kind of two offices, and you walk through the assistant director's office like to to get back here to uh, to uh, to Mike's office. But that I mean it's it's right there. It's for everybody to I see, see. Yep. over and over and over again every day and. Uh, I think that um, that's it's funny that uh, 
I, I guess we're all busy. College students are busy. Uh, right out of college, you're busy. You're either learning a new job or a new profession in your field if you're lucky, or you're trying to make ends meet while still pursuing other things, which you're busy. Uh, I we'll now come have come up with a good idea. Of what yep. do I do with this education I just got? I now have a kid, just like this whole other level. I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm working on hits publications, like multiple books at one time. I'm hosting two podcasts, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's, which, it, whatever. I got a lot of stuff going on, as most humans do, you know, uh, but I'm getting better as I go at, uh, at prioritizing and right. figuring out. Um, another great system is getting things done by, uh, David Allen. That's a really, really great book. And one of the takeaways from that, um, which I love, which is something that would not get up on the board, um, is that um, his thing is that if you come across a task that will take you three minutes or less to accomplish, and if you physically have that 10 seconds, two minutes, up to three minutes, then do it on the spot. Right. Do it so first. don't read an email that is going to take two well-thought-out oh, paragraphs, which will take you... 30 seconds to type, 45 seconds to proofread, and then hit send. Do not have that holding over your head because then your piles up. Your piles up and you're having, uh, you're having dinner with your girlfriend or wife or husband or boyfriend, or whatever. And then I'll say, Oh, I've, I got to send that in on it. And you can we're get just, bogged down. and we're never present. You, you know, you pick, you pick the wrong one to start with and you get bogged down in it. That, that one that could have been over waits and waits. May you may lose the opportunity. Piss somebody off, something like that. Yep. But then also, you might wear yourself out on that larger one, and then you don't even have the capability. Like it, you, you could have knocked it out so easily when you were fresh, but then you can't do it, and then it gets pushed the next day. Could be forgotten. Yes. All sorts of things can happen. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that, that's great. Uh, okay, so uh, we are uh, up to the uh, the five questions uh, portion of uh, of the festivities Let's here. Do it. Uh, all right, question number one is: uh, What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? To pay attention to what you see and know that other people can't see what you can see. Yeah, you said that before. I really like that. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. All right, number two. What is a mistake you have made in your career, and what did you learn from it? Not keeping a good balance on the professional sides of my relationship when I'm friends with that same person. And uh, what I learned is friendships can get strained, but you got to keep work square 100%. You know, you can, you can have a fight with a friend, and then that can mend. But if you aren't taking care of business, it can be almost impossible to recover from it. So if you got to pick between the friendship and the work, I'm telling you, get the work straight because that will take care of the friendship. Hmm. Uh, that's really good advice. Um, <clears throat> as a tangent to that, uh, something I learned from uh, Pat Sheridan, who uh, was the, the uh, second guest ever on, uh, on the podcast here. Um, he's got a policy that if he's dealing with anybody whether this is a friend or more likely just some business partner, could be a major partner, could be just a one-off thing, that if anything gets even remotely weird, you know, just kind of like the wording of an email, it just isn't really sitting well. Like it seems like the other person's like passive aggressively not thrilled or uh, surprised by something, just whatever, just something 1% weird that he always picks up the phone and yeah. that he, and that he calls them. Right. Because, uh, speaking to them actually, um, you know, actually using words with somebody, even over the phone, but also uh, tone of voice and yes, and, and tone, yes, and 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 the the conversation can take such turns just be, by hearing someone's emotional reaction and thinking about how many different ways written words can be taken that you don't you didn't even understand what they were saying. Yes, absolutely. Yep, yep. Um, okay, what is a book you'd recommend to musical entrepreneurs? It's The Alchemist. It's uh, Paulo Coelho. It is uh, about it is about listening to dreams. It is about realization of uh, long term goals with um, using using a lot of short term goals. It's about um, allowing the unexpected twists and turns, uh, even if they feel like they're going to take you away from your, your larger goal. You don't even know what the universe has in store for you, and just kind of let it unfold on its own and be patient. That's good advice. I should just keep asking you advice questions. Yeah, we can. 
could probably keep that interesting for another half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, number four, who do you look up to as an arts entrepreneur? You know, I just have so much respect uh, for what Questlove has done, um, particularly as he has, in my mind, you know, he is as close to, you know, a scholar as in, in many cases as any place even has. Um, you know, I don't actually know what his educational background is, but what I know is when he talks, he is showing depth, insight, um, into our American culture, showing passion, um, and, and a, just a huge breadth of knowledge about recordings and bands and players. And then he picks up the sticks and, and his beats. I was so fortunate to get to hear him at the Brooklyn Bowl a couple years back and his approach to the drums. I just felt like I was sitting there for something, one of the most important things I'd ever witnessed, just hmm. him playing beats. Uh, and then he got up off the drums and he DJed the set and, uh, you know, mixing tunes. Here's the, here's the mega hit that you know, but here's the song it was actually based on from 20 years prior. Or he wouldn't even play the mega hit because you probably already know that. So here's this beat. Here's this sample. Here's this melody, whatever it is. And, uh, I didn't even want to dance. I just wanted to stand behind him, which I was able to do. I'll stand, be able to stand behind him and just watch him from behind as he was DJing. And it was, hmm. it was incredible. Cool. All right, number five. What have you always wanted to achieve in the music business that you haven't to this point? The next big thing, two, there are two things in store for me. One's performance and one's more like a, a, a like a, um, uh, getting people together and, and organizing people. The, uh, the artistic thing is I need to be able to do a fully improvised, unaccompanied recital. You need to be able to step out on stage and improvise the entire thing and have it be compelling, uh, have it, uh, be of consequence and be entertaining. That's my kind of, that's my kind of gig right there. Yeah. I'm, uh, and sometimes I'm working hard on that and sometimes I let that slide. Like, like I said, the adventure takes me somewhere I didn't expect, but, uh, that's coming. And, uh, from a organizing people standpoint, by this point, you know, all those schools I went to, the little gigs that have shown up, teaching uh, engagements and all these things that have happened. I have just been around just some badasses, just some beautiful, beautiful souls, beautiful artists. And uh, I want to put together a concert where we get to have that interaction. And I want to, I want it to be not because, not because just out of our friendship, not because it's going to be a good artistic experience. I want everything. I want the, I want the Quan. I want the, you're thinking back to Jerry Maguire. I want the Quan. I want the, I want the, the love. I want it to be a respected event. I want all the money. I want everyone to be taken care of and happy that they did it. Um, I want the food to be banging. I want the party afterwards to be rocking. Um, and I'm not even sure what kind of venue would even allow for this to happen. Is this, is this like an outdoor kind of thing or Red concert Rocks. hall? All right. Red Rocks. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Um, and just, just getting, you know, all, all the folks that I made great music with in school, that was over 10 years ago, where are we at now? What kinds of things can we put together now? And I'm looking forward to doing that. Where can people find you online? You can find Doc Nixon, the Green Machine on Facebook, uh, GMU Green Machine on Twitter. And we also have our Instagram, same thing, GMU Green Machine, um, Michael Nickens, you can find Doc Nix one two uh, at uh, that's at Twitter the the at Doc Nix one two. You can also find Michael Nickens on Facebook. Uh, Greenmachine.gmu.edu is our uh, our pet band's website. Um, so just all around the web web like that. Shoot us a message, and who knows what's possible. And if you just want to catch a show, uh, come to Fairfax, Virginia, the Eagle Bank Arena, and the Green Machine will be playing at every men's basketball game, every women's basketball game. Fantastic. Uh, anything else you want to add or plug? Yeah, the um, driving around D.C. area, we got our airports. We have National Airport, and we have Dulles, and then we have BWI. And every time I drive to BWI, you know, I see the signs on the road. And at one point, you know, you drive by yourself, and you just, like, see it, and you, like, you start to, like, spell, like pronounce acronyms, right? BWI, Baltimore, Washington International, right? And I was like, Bui, what is Bui? <laughs> and I'm like, I got it. I know what it is. 
So what, what BWI needs is a billboard with Flavor Flav on it <laughs> saying, yeah, we, uh, right? I was wondering where this was going. <laughs> <laughs> to which another friend of mine said, no, they need Thurgood Marshall dressed as Flavor Flav. <laughs> oh, man. And that's it, man. Yeah, this is where, like, the, the producer could just cut that out, you know, at the very end. But but I actually, uh, both here and the Brass Junkies, we like the awkward thing. Like, yeah, and then, like, it was super insightful about, like, networking and writing down goals and prioritizing. And then he, like, went off the deep end. He was talking about <laughs> Thurgood Marshall and... Flavor Flav and like an ad campaign for an airport and yeah man, uh, yeah, man. <laughs> you all just got the full uh, Doc Nix uh, experience right there yeah nope. scholarly uh, scholarly whack job yeah how's uh, yeah, there, there we go so well thank you so much for doing this thanks for having me yeah man. of course awesome. and uh, this uh, wraps another episode of the Entrepreneurial Musician. You've been listening to The Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. You can sign up for my monthly newsletter and find my blog at andrewhitz.com. You can also find me at facebook.com slash hitstuba, and I'm at hitstuba on Twitter. The Entrepreneurial Musician is produced by Austin Boyer and Buddy Deschler of the Fredericksburg Brass Institute. Executive producer is Andrew Hitz. The theme music was performed by Ben Barron, Rich Kelly, Daniel LaPelle, and Andrew Hitz. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. <laughs>